Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm a child of God, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. So what is the good news? It's that Jesus left his throne in heaven, and he was born a very humble birth here on earth in a manger. He grew up and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He did nothing wrong, ever. Um, he fulfilled the law, the law of God. And he um, died on the cross for our sins. Because we are all sinners. And we all need a savior. We can't save ourselves. Um, we owe a debt of sin. And Jesus paid that debt for us on the cross. He rose again um, from the grave after being buried for three days. He rose again. And he defeated Satan. He defeated death. He finished his work. And he ascended into heaven. And he's coming back for us very soon. In a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, which is about to come on the whole world we will be coming back with him and he will set up his thousand year millennial reign. So what can you do to be saved? It's really simple. We are living in the age of grace. That means that if you believe in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, you will be saved. If you put your faith and your trust in him and him alone, he will the Holy Spirit will come into you and guide you and um, you will be sealed to the very end and you will be prom you're, you're promised eternity in heaven or eternity with Jesus. Um, it's a free gift. You can't earn it. You need to just believe and um, pray. Pray um, to Jesus, to God. This starts you out with a relationship with God, and you need that relationship with God to make it in this world. Read your Bible, study the Word, and always, always trust in Jesus. Well, this is um, part three of the my series on the book of Revelation, and um, we're going to cover chapter 11 and 12. And I'm hoping to cover chapter 13 as well. Um, I do want to keep this video under an hour. Um, because because it takes me forever, I'll just be honest, to upload these when they're two hours, two and a half hours. Um, but the book of Revelation is such an amazing book. And it's worth looking at, especially today in the, in the hours that we're living in, we are in the last days and, um, many will be left behind after the rapture. And I'm hoping that somehow some of this message will get to the left behind. Um, we don't know that any of these videos will survive. Um, but we're here to plant seeds and we're here to spread the word of God. And I believe that this is a very important topic today. So, um, we'll start with chapter 11. Um, you can look back at my last two videos where we did, um, the church, the church age and the rapture. And, um, that was part one, chapters one through four. And then we looked at chapters, um, five through 10, which is the tribulate, the tribulation and the saints. And now we're looking at chapter 11, 12 and 13. Um, chapter 11 deals with the spiritual life of Israel, while chapter 12 describes her persecution. Since one needs a place for communication with God, we see that a temple has been erected. Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. The measuring reed 
like onto a rod, is most likely from the breaks of the Jordan Valley and is probably about 10 feet in length. Um, through the angel, John is told to measure the temple of God and the altar, as well as the people of Israel, concerning their spirituality. The first place of worship ever built was called Solomon's Temple and is discussed in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, 28, 29, and 2 Chronicles chapters 2 through 7. The temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in approximately 590 BC. Seventy years later, it was rebuilt under Zerubbabel and Joshua. The second temple was desecrated by, Ant by Antichus Epiphanes um, in Greco-Syrian rule. Um, he stuck a pig in the temple, an act which prefigured the final desecration to occur under Antichrist as he set up the abomination of desolation in the tribulation temple, Matthew 24, 15. Now we find that a third temple has been erected. It is probably not the final millennial temple of Ezekiel 40 through 48, but one which is built during the tribulation hour and is used sacred, sacred, sacrilegiously um, by the beast who claims to be God. See 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. This temple, its altar, and the attendants are Jewish. There is no outer court for Gentiles as there was in past temples. Verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city and the holy siddle, city and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Notice this temple has nothing to do with the church, um, which is already in heaven. Chapter four, verse one. It is for Jews, not Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. In the second temple rebuilt and enlarged by Herod the Great in 20 or 21 BC. Um, the outer court was marked off from the inner one, where only Israel was permitted to enter. The courts were separated by the middle wall of partition, uh, Ephesians 2.14, and no Gentile was allowed beyond that point. When the Apostle Paul broke this rule, angry Jews almost killed him crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law. And this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Acts 21, 28. So as John measures the tribulation temple, he is told to omit the outer court, undoubtedly because Gentiles will trample the holy city, Jerusalem, under their feet for 42 months. There is no doubt about the literalness of this seven-year period. Daniel's first 69 weeks, um, see Daniel 9, 24 through 26, totaled 483 years. And we recall from our discussion in chapter 6 that the term week is Shabuah or Shab Shabuim um, in the original Hebrew and means seven years. Thus, 69 multiplied by 7 equals 483 years to the day, or 2,520 days as well. Um, the formula is so clear that a child can grasp it. One half of the 2,520 is 1,260 days. So 42 months of 30 days each, or 3 and 1 half years. Conversely, two times three and one half years equals seven years, or 84 months of 30 days each, or 2,520 days. Don't forget to take into account that the old Jewish calendar contained 12 months of 30 days each, not the 365 days of modern calendars. So is the seven-year plan scriptural then? We can check for ourselves because the days are mentioned in chapter 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6, as 1,260. Likewise, the months are mentioned in chapter 11, verse 2, and chapter 13, verse 5, as 42. Again, we can easily see that the 1,260 days multiplied by 2 equals 2,520 days, and that 42 multiplied by 2 equals 84 months 
or um, one Shabua or seven years. One does not have to be a mathematical wizard or a calcul um, calculus genius to discover that the tribulation is a full seven years in duration. Take it literally. During the final half of the seven years, two witnesses appear. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These two witnesses are God's prophets, sent to proclaim his message of doom. They are clothed in sackcloth. In the Bible, sackcloth and ashes always picture repentance, and repentance is demanded when sin stalks a nation. Repentance is God's call to either turn or burn. The witnesses are described in the next verse. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Olive trees exude oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Candlesticks are light bearers. Thus we have a beautiful picture of two chosen witnesses anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming the message of the light in the midst of the sin-blackened world. There is no other way to do God's service. All be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 There has been a great deal of discussion concerning the identity of these two witnesses. Most Bible scholars believe they are either Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch. Malachi is explicit in predicting Elijah's future appearance upon earth. He states, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 5. Thus there is no doubt about Elijah being one of the witnesses. The prediction is corroborated by the fact that Elijah did not die a physical death, but was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. Um, see 2 Kings 2, 9 through 11. And Hebrews 11, 5. He also prophesied the coming day of God's judgment and the return of Christ with his church. See Jude 14 and 15. Since Enoch's earthly ministry predated the establishment of the Jewish race, he is considered by some as God's first prophet to the Gentiles. Elijah, on the other hand, was God's prophet to Israel. Thus, since God's witness during the tribulation hour is to both groups, many believe the two witnesses to be Elijah and Enoch. Personally, I believe that Moses will be the other witness because he appeared with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. See Matthew 17, 1 through 8. A preview of the glory to come in that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will be the only important one. The preview indicates that when the day finally arrives, Moses and Elijah, also called Elias, representatives of the law and of the prophets, will be present, undoubtedly as the two witnesses. Now, concerning Moses, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Deuteronomy 18, 15, 18, and 19. Um, one should also keep in mind that the body of Moses was preserved by God. Jude verse 9 declares, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. These witnesses, dressed in sackcloth and proclaiming the message of judgment, will be hated. Latter-day terrorists will attempt to destroy them. God, however, forbids it and offers um, sovereign protection. Ugh. 
my hair's kind of kind of staticky. It's funny, it's raining out now. Um, um, but verse five, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. This can be nothing but supernatural power and intervention. The fact that the two witnesses have superhuman anointing is evidence from the next verse. These, verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the, in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. One of these two witnesses, Elijah or Elias, performed this very miracle in earlier days. Elias prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. James 5, 17 and 18. Moses, the second witness, had power along with Aaron, his brother, to turn the waters into blood and smite the earth with diversified plagues. See Exodus 7, verse 10. Thus, the tribulation ministry of these two supernaturally anointed prophets will be but a repeat performance. During the entire period of their witness, they cannot be killed. Their death must be at God's appointed time. Um, verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Isn't it wonderful to know that nothing can happen to any child of God without the Lord's divine permission? What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arms. That's right. No one can take a believer's life without the permissive will of God. Is there not an appointed time to man upon the earth? Job 7 verse 1. It is appointed unto men once to die. Hebrews 9 27. This is why Christians should always say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. James 4 15. At this point, the time of the witnesses um, testifying ends. God's purpose for his two servants have been completed. Soon they will be called home. The method of their release from the body is death at the hands of the beast. His conduct is identical to that of the now deceased um, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, um, who had the bodies of Americans, of America's brave, ser um, brave servicemen displayed in the streets of Tehran following April 1980 hostage rescue attempt. His action was one of the most repulsive, repugnant sights ever witnessed. Um, and I probably butchered his name, but the Antichrist commits the same dastardly deed with the bodies of Moses and Elijah. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Since the Lord was crucified in this city, we know it to be Jerusalem. The term great city is the holy city, Jerusalem of verse 2. Why then is it called Sodom and Egypt? Because the moral and spiritual conditions that existed in Sodom before its destruction and the idolatrous iniquities that abounded in Egypt before God judged the land are found um, in New inundating um, Jerusalem during this period of time. All the preaching of repentance by these two witnesses in sackcloth does not change the wicked complexion of the city. The death of the two witnesses is observed by the entire world, as evidenced by the next verse, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves satellite television beaming the identical image to every nation on earth and into every home equipped with a receiver allows the spectacle to be observed internationally. The action constitutes a victory celebration by the Antichrist. 
similar to Colmini's televised production. All right, K-H-O-M-E-I-N-I. -I. Um, in response, the world rejoices. The two gloom and doom preachers are gone. No longer will two hellfire advocates spoil their tea parties. No longer will their beer and salami festivals be hindered. The two witnesses are dead. The rains will start again. <sighs> um, but wait. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets torment that tormented them that dwell on the earth. Um, yeah, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. So the party is coming to an end here. Um, their food will soon stick in their throats. A miracle of spectacular proportions is about to occur. Verse 11. And after three days and 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 half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Um, verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Elijah and Moses received the same treatment as the raptured saints in Revelation 4.1. They depart for glory in a twinkling of an eye. At this, as this awe-inspiring sight is being observed, God sends judgment for all the sacrilegious acts, the violent um, drug-crazed crowds um, per perpetrated on these two servants. Verse 13, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Talk about a uh, television spectacular. Two men come to life again, and then vanish in a cloud. Next, an unpre unprecedented earthquake hits the city, and 7,000 um, celebrities, uh, the interpretations of many scholars, um, yes, big names among the elite, are killed. This video extravaganza will make the nightly news seem like child's play. And um, it will be obvious that God brought these two witnesses back to life and basically harpazzled them, raptured them, the way the Christians had been raptured. This also brings um, many to remember, I believe, that, um, or to understand that that's where we went. Those who live through the experience become exceedingly frightened and begin to praise God. However, it is not from converted hearts that they exalt him. No. Instead, their praise is the result of astonishment and alarm. The reaction is similar to that of the scribes and the Pharisees who witnessed the miracle of the healed paralytic and were all amazed and glorified God and were filled with fear. See Luke 5, 26. They did not get saved, just scared. Some people develop a spiritual vocabulary in a hurry. Wait until atom atomic bombs and nukes begin flying. Prayer and praise will become the order of the day. We come now to the third woe. Remember the angel in chapter 8, verse 13, who cried, Woe, woe, woe. Each woe depicted a different judgment. Each in turn became more severe. The first woe was the fifth trumpet blast. The second woe, the sixth trumpet blast. At this point, the final woe, or seventh trumpet, is about to sound. Verse 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The picture before us is the same as the one in chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, the return of the king. If one remembers that chapters 6 through 11 and 12 through 19, 15 run concurrently or side by side, during the tribulation hour, he will understand why the king returns both in chapter 11, verse 15, and in chapter 19, verse 16. 
chapters 12 through 19, are but a repeat of the events described in chapters 6 through 11. Now as the king returns, a praise and worship service begins. Verse 16, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. This is an act of gratitude. Remember that the 24 elders represent all believers, Old and New Testament, who have lived on this earth and who have been raptured to heaven in chapter 4, verse 1. They know firsthand that Satan has been the god of this world system. See 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. They understand fully that the nations of this world have been under his control. See Matthew 4, 8, and 9. But now, praise God, Satan's reign has finally ended. The king has come. There is great rejoicing in heaven among the raptured saints as the midnight newscast is shared. They unitedly pray. Verse 17 saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Their prayer is to Christ. Um, the one who used the title, which art and was and art to come, the power that was always his, um, the power that was always his, has now been embraced, and he has begun his reign. The wicked are upset over the king's return. Verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Notice the number of happenings which transpire at the king's return. First, the nations are angry. This is also observed in the other text describing the king's descent to earth. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on his horse and against his army. Chapter 19, verse 19. Um, we will be getting to chapter 19, just not, not today. Um, but we are going to go through the whole book of Revelation. Um, but fourth, the faithful prophets and saints, small and great, are rewarded at the end of the 1,000 years. This is not a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. See 2 Corinthians 5.10. Then believers were raptured, chapter 4, verse 1. Investigated, chapter 4, verse 2. Coronated in chapter 4, verse 4. And exalted as they laid their crowns at Jesus' feet, chapter 4, verse 10. Long before the tribulation hour ended, the, rewarded, um, the rewards presented at this time are for those who were faithful during the kingdom age, those who did not rebel and follow Satan at its conclusion, chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Fifth, those who destroyed the earth are destroyed. This refers to spirit beings who followed the destroyer, Satan. Um, their destruction is separate from that of the nations. Hence the division between the two in verse 18. Satanic beings receive their judgment at this hour, as well as the earth dwellers. In the midst of all of this, Israel is spared. Verse 19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. The temple of God and the ark of the testament both connected with Jewish worship picture Israel. Thus, in the midst of lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail, God spares his covenant people. <sighs> Chapter 12. Now, some may think that I should go chapter 12 through um, chapter 19, but I'm going to be honest with you. I just don't have the time. Um, so we will be continuing. Um, but I think this gives us chapters 10, um, chapters 11, 12, and 13 gives us a lot to chew on. And then um, we'll continue on after. But as noted previously, chapters 12 through 19 constitute a rerun of the tribulation hour as presented in chapters 6 through 11. Thus, at this point, we come once again to the middle of the tribulation and to the worst wave of anti-Semitism that the world has ever observed. 
boy, are we seeing that today? It's pretty crazy. I didn't even realize how bad anti-Semitism was until um, this Jubilee War in Israel that started on October 7th. Um, it's really shedding light on people's, um, yeah. I, I know you're seeing it too. But this is truly what Jeremiah had in mind in chapter 30, verse 7, when he said, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Even um, It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, as one discovers in Romans eleven twenty six, is Israel. A number of great signs and occurrences are witnessed in this chapter, each having to do with the horrendous judgment that is enveloping the earth, including the prosecution, the persecution being directed against Israel. These include a great wonder, verse 1, a great red dragon, verse 3, great wrath, verse 12, and two wings of a great eagle, verse 14. Verse 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. In total, the book of Revelation pictures four different women, Jezebel, the high priestess of paganism, in chapter 2, verse 20, the Scarlet Woman, the High Priestess of Apostasy in chapter 17, um, the Lamb's Wife, the Repentance of the True Blood-Bought Church in um, chapter 19, verse 7, and Israel in the text before us. Um, this woman of chapter 12 is a picture of Israel. Mary Baker Eddy Glover Patterson presented herself as this woman, but her claim was absurd, to say the least. The woman's offspring could not possibly be the Christian science movement. Um, who then is this woman and why does she appear? The term wonder in our text comes from the same Greek word sign. Thus we see that the woman is a sign. What sign? The sign of Israel. And we just, just saw this sign in our skies. In fact, it's, we're still looking at it. Um, the child that just left her womb is headed towards the scales of Libra, which used to be called the altar, and that's where the child will be on November 11th. <sighs> that's amazing. Um, but the woman of Revelation 12, 1, was pictured in the dream of Joseph um, centuries ago. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon representing father and mother, and the eleven stars representing Joseph's eleven brothers, made obeisance to me, the twelfth star, and he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And this brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Clearly, the woman clothed with the sun and wearing a crown of 12 stars upon her head, just like in Joseph's dream, is Israel. The birth of this woman's son is predicted in Isaiah 66, verse 7 and 8. Before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child who hath heard such a thing. Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children, or her son. Isaiah's prediction finds its fulfillment in the next verse. Verse 2, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Here we have the mother, Israel, bringing forth a man-child who is none other than the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. As one discovers in verse 5, um, this truth um, harm harmonizes with many New Testament texts. For instance, Romans 9, 4, and 5 states, They are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Christ in his flesh came forth from Israel. And at this point in our text, Christ's adversary, Satan, 
the one who rebelled centuries ago against the authority of God, see Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, is about to strike another blow. Verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in the heavens, and behold, a red, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Um, verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and he did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Um, the red dragon is conclusively proven to be Satan in verse nine. The numbers seven, um, the number seven, speak of completeness, and therefore the dragon's seven heads picture his wisdom. It is written that Satan is full of wisdom. Ezekiel twenty-eight twelve. God created him um, that way when he was the anointed cherub or angel that covereth. Ezekiel 28, 14. His ten horns speak of universal power, just as the ten toes of Daniel's image do. Satan's international control, of course, is possible because millions of demons jump at his command. Remember, he is the god of this world system. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He is also the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2, 2. And the prince of this world. John 12, 31. However, since he is not omnis, uh, omniscient, all-knowing, or, um, or omni, omnipresent in all places at all times, Satan must rely on demon, demonic hosts, fallen angels, in diversified places to administer his power. This explains why Christians are not fighting against flesh and blood, only but spiritual wickedness in high places as well. Ephesians 6, 12. Satan probably enlisted the angels who fell at the time of his rebellion when his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. This is a reference to angels and did cast them to the earth. A similar reference is found in Jude 13. At this point, one may ask why we use these texts to discuss past, present, and future history. And the answer is simple. The scene we are about to witness speaks of the entire age-long conflict from beginning to end. It, its details are squeezed into um, these few verses before us. The same devil who attempted to destroy the woman, um, the woman's son or Israel's son, in centuries past, see, generation, um, see Genesis 3.15, is now about to strike out against the woman herself via the greatest anti-Semitic purge in history. Hitler's murderous and barbaric attempt at Jewish annihilation will seem like a Sunday school picnic compared to this Holocaust. That's why Daniel stated, There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book. 12.1 Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 21, and 22, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. The elect, as spoken of here, are the Israelites of Romans eleven twenty eight. Verse 5 proves my earlier, uh, my earlier statement that the verse before us cover the age-long conflict, past, present, and future. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child over 2,000 years ago who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's in the future. And her child was caught up onto God and to his throne. That's the present age of grace. That's the rapture. Um, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared by God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. During this final 42-month period described as the Great Tribulation, see Revelation 7, 14. Because of its intensity and immensity, the children of Israel are protected by their God. He took care of them for 40 years as they wandered through the wilderness, and now he again proves his love to his ancient people by delivering them. Yes, they shall be saved out of it, Jeremiah 37, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, Daniel 12, 1. Matthew 24, 22 adds, For the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. 
the elect in this text is unmistakably Jews. Um, see Isaiah 42, 1, 45, 4, 65, 9, and 22. Um, in the next few verses, a shocking space, space war takes place. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. With him. Some biblical authorities believe that this war in heaven began at the time of the rapture in 4 verse 1, chapter 4 verse 1. Since a war involves a number of skirmishes or battles, this is a distinct possibility. The assumption is based on um, Daniel 12, 1 and 2. These scholars reason that since those who are caught up in the rapture of the church must pass through the areas where Satan reigns, the aerial and stellar heavens, Satan becomes aroused and attempts to hinder this evacuation of the saints from the earth. However, as he attempts to interfere in this glorious event, angels, ministers of the saints, see Hebrews 1.14, rush to the rescue, and the space confrontation and conflagration begins. This happened in the past. Why could it not occur again? And that does make sense when you think about how Satan goes after the child um, in the Revelation 12, one sign. Um, where did it happen in the past? Well, consider Daniel 10, 13. As we are introduced to Michael, the commander in chief of heaven's armies, Daniel says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, an angelic name and title, came to help me. God tells Daniel that he had every intention of answering his prayers, but that for 21 days the devil tried to hinder the response. Finally, God had to send Michael to, to battle the devil in the area of his domain, the first and second heavens, in order to make the answer a reality. Thus, it is possible that Michael will again battle God's adversary at the time of the rapture in order to allow Christians their entrance into glory in the twinkling of an eye, as promised in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. Um, Michael is mentioned five times in God's word, beginning with Daniel 10, 13. We find him again in Daniel 10, 21, uh, 21 where he is described to the children of Israel as Michael, your prince. His third mention is in Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. In Jude 9, we find Michael the archangel contending with the evil, um, with the devil over the body of Moses. Notice that every time Michael appears, he is connected with the children of Israel, making it very plausible that he is at war with Satan in our present and fifth text, defending the Jewish people. The war is on and it is the greatest aerial combat in history. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon fought and his angels. Are you shocked to discover Satan still in heaven? Most people, including most Christians, imagine him as a little creature dressed in red, um, in a red uniform, running around in a place called hell, jabbing his victims with a pitchfork. This is all a lot of mythological nonsense. Satan is a magnificent creature to behold. In fact, his beauty brought his ruin. Ezekiel 28, 17 states, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Not only is it a lie to picture Satan as a grotesque monstrosity, but it is equally false to place him in hell. He has never been there. He is the God of this world system, the prince of the power of the air, and the prince of this world, as we have already observed. He has been in the heavens um, one and two, in heaven one and two, the aerial and stellar heavens since his fall, and he will remain there until he is cast to the earth in verse 9. It is also important to note that he is not cast into eternal hell, the lake of fire, to join those that he's duped until after the millennium, verse 20, verse 10. Now, as this battle is fought, Satan is defeated, 
Praise God. Satan is mighty, but God is almighty. Satan can destroy, but God can destroy the destroyer. That is why the Christian should never fear the events of daily life. He has victory in Jesus. Yes, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Satan's demise began when he was cast out of the third heaven. See Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. And, um, and this continues until Revelation 12, 9, when he is cast out of the first and second heavens and is completed when he is cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 20, verse 10. John foresaw that hour and said, The prince of this world shall be cast out. John 12, 31. And the prince of this world is judged. John 16, 11. To the eternal Christ, Satan's doom was as good as accomplished. But for you and me, time had to pass. Now, in our text, the moment has arrived. Satan and his angels prevailed not. Verse 8. Michael's, um, Michael's gunner's zero in and Satan's place and abiding location for centuries is found no longer. Instead, the dragon, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, is cast out into the earth and his angels are cast out with him. This signals the end of Satan's rule in the aerial and stellar heavens. And the victory um, celebrations begin. All heaven rejoices over that which Michael's defeat of Satan has accomplished. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is, come, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. This spontaneous praise session within this verse occurs because, number one, salvation from Satan's atmospheric control has taken place. And two, God's strength has crushed Satan's might. And number three, the kingdom is about to arrive. And four, the power of Christ will be seen as he comes to set up his kingdom. Think of it. The united power of father and son casts the accuser of the brethren out of the heavens. Did you know that accusing the brethren is Satan's present ministry? He also uses some ministers and holier-than-thou church members to accomplish this goal. Listen carefully. Every bit of slander against another brother or sister in Christ is simply the devil using an individual's mind and vocal cords. In fact, devil means slanderer. The term false accuser in the English Bible is translated from the word dia diabolus or devil. Um, thus, Titus 2.3 states, the aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. Literally rendered, this verse states, that the aged woman be not she-devils. A woman who gossips is a she-devil, and a male gossip is a macho devil. Both are controlled by the power of the vile one. No wonder lying is one of the seven sins God hates. See Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. When Satan is cast out into the earth, verse 9, the hot spot will be our terra firma, where men walk and breathe. Um, at that time, there will there will, on, um, there will be only one place of safety and victory in the arms of the Lord, um, Jesus through his shed blood. Verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Um, these wise saints resisted, state, um, resisted Satan by the blood of Jesus and by the word of God. There is no other way to win a spiritual battle. See Hebrews 4.12. They also overcame Satan by their testimony and loved not their own lives unto death. What a crown awaits them and you if you're true blue. Um, thus John states in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee <coughs> a crown of life. Um, though there is rejoicing in the heavenlies, the picture is quite different for earth dwellers. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the, inhabitor, to the inhabitors of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he hath but a short time. At this point, Satan unleashes all his fury, for he knows that within 42 months, three and one half years, his reign will be ended. 
thus the great anti-Semitic um, anti purge now begins. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which bring forth the man-child. Immediately God intervenes. Verse 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. This verse describes God in his sovereignty and love protecting his chosen people for three and one half years. The eagle wings probably indicate an airlift or some other miraculous speedy escape. God is probably reminding the children of Israel of his act of um, preservation in Pharaoh's day and uses the picture of wings to show them his goodness. Um, he declares, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how, and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Exodus 19, 4. Safety is promised to his people. Now, a lot of people believe that it's Petra is where they're going to be going. They're going to flee to Petra um, where they will be safe. But verse 15 says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood the flood undoubtedly portrays a volume of propaganda anti-semitic insinuations slanders and slurs released internationally um, yet god promises when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the lord shall lift up a standard against him isaiah fifty nine nineteen. now we see that this isn't literal because um, verse 15 says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. It doesn't say it is a flood. It says water as a flood. Um, so we won't, you can, I mean, you could take that literally. However, I, um, I think that it's basically the anti-Seminism that's going to, um, come upon them like a flood. Uh, verse 16, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now this verse too is reminiscent of the miraculous deliverance God provided the children of Israel during their exodus from Egypt. When the Red Sea closed in over Pharaoh and his army, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretcheth, stretcheth out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Exodus 15, 9 through 12. At this point, Satan reaches the height of his anger. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 13, um, this chapter introduces us to two beasts. The first one, commonly known as the Antichrist, is unveiled in verses 1 through 10, while the second beast, known as the false prophet, is revealed in verse 11 through 18. The first beast is political. The second is religious. Both, however, are energized by the power of Satan and thus constitute an unholy trinity, the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Remember, Satan is the great imitator, the incarnation of himself in these two villains in his final attempt to wreak havoc upon earth. Knowing that he has but a short time left, he makes an all-out move to usurp God's position and authority through his two allies, the beasts of this chapter. Verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. As stated earlier in our study, Bible chapters and verses came into existence in the 1500s. They are very helpful in locating passages, but they are not inspired. At times, they even cloud the information being presented. Actually, verse 1 of chapter 13 should have been part of chapter 12. For the subject is Satan and his persecution of earth dwellers. 
Therefore, according to the original Greek manuscript, the personal pronoun should be he instead of I, because he pictures Satan standing upon the sand of the sea. Accordingly, this portion of scripture should read, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and Satan stood upon the sand of the sea. Satan standing upon the sand of the sea pictures his control over earth's teeming millions at an appointed time. Chapter 17, verse 5, and chapter 20, verse 8. This control is established through the two satanically inspired beasts who come out of the sea and the earth. The first beast, which is the Antichrist, rises out of the sea and has seven heads and ten horns. Upon his horns, ten crowns. He is a literal man, but demon-possessed, for he, or his power, um, comes, out, comes out of the abyss. For the beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Chapter 17, verse 8. The seven heads, loaded with blasphemy, also portray the five kings who had ruled up to John's day, the sixth king who was in power at that time, and the seventh king who will reign as the Antichrist during the tribulation hour. Chapter 17, verse 10 confirms, um, confirms this. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Likewise, the ten horns also picture ten nations over whom the beast or Antichrist rules. The scene before us pictures the final or seventh world leader ruling over a confederation of ten nations during the end times. In order to understand that the ten horns are actually ten western nations, each of which was part of the old Roman Empire, one must study the prophecy of Daniel in chapters 2 and 7, the book bearing his name. Um, let's digress for a moment and investigate. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in Daniel's day had a dream. When he awakened, however, he could not recall the dream. Therefore, he called his magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers together, requesting that they both recall the dream and explain its meaning. Not one of them was able to do so, even under the sentence of death. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then was the secret revealed in, um, unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel 2, 13 um, 16 and 19. Um, next, we find Daniel in the presence of the king, explaining God's vision to him in verses 27 through 36. This is one of the most important texts in the entire Bible because it reveals the history of the world from that time to our present day. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show on to the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for, as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head this image's head was of fine gold his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like a chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. 
Nebuchadnezzar was astonished as his dream was revealed and shocked as its interpretation was given. Daniel told the king that he, Nebuchadnezzar, as the leader of the Babylonian empire was the head of gold and that the two arms of silver representing the Medes and the Persians would soon overthrow him. Next, the stomach and thighs of brass, Greece, would defeat the Medes and the Persians. Eventually, the two legs of iron, the Roman Empire headquartered at Rome and Constantinople, would conquer the Greco um, Empire. These events occurred exactly as God has revealed them to Daniel, and as he in turn told Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice something extremely important the ten toes of iron and clay never destroyed the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. Why? Um, Rome fell through internal corruption. This historical fact is the subject of Edward Gibbon's great book, The History of the Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Therefore, we see that the final world power is a union of ten Western nations represented by the ten toes of the great image. The iron tells us these nations were part of the old the old Roman Empire, whereas the clay speaks of a deterioration as the empire weakened over the centuries. Thus, the final world, um, world power will not be communism, but a confederation of ten Western nations under the first beast, or the Antichrist. The ten toes also coincide with the ten horns of the beast in the verse under consideration. Um, in the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, chapter 2, 36 through 44, Daniel described the toes as kingdoms, concluding with the statement, And in the days of these kings, ten of them, as pictured by the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Um, for centuries, Christians have prayed Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come. During the tribulation hour, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists of Revelation 7, 3 through 8 will preach the gospel of the kingdom, um, the good news that the king is about to return. And can you hear them shouting this exciting information in the streets? The king is coming. The king is coming. Finally, the king is seen returning in chapter 11, verse 15, and chapter 19, verse 16. And this event of the ages takes place when a final confederation of ten Western nations has been established upon earth. Could the present European Union be a part of this picture? Um, I believe it could be. <sighs> Jesus is coming soon. Um, at this point, we need to consider another extremely important fact. Ireland and Denmark. Um, present common market members were never part of the old... Um, Roman Empire. This apparent problem, however, is quickly resolved when one considers the information presented in Daniel chapter 7. Here we discover that following the establishment of a ten-nation confederacy, another world leader arises. He takes control, outs three of the nations, and replaces them with two others and his own. Specifically, Daniel says, I considered the horns, ten of them, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns, original members, plucked up by the roots, 7-8. This coincides perfectly with Revelation 13-5. Um, Daniel continues in verses 24 and 25, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. Here we not only see the world leader overpowering three kings and replacing them with original members of the old Roman Empire, we also observe him fulfilling the prediction of blasphemy described in our text. There is no doubt about it. A confederacy of ten Western nations will be formed. Then another leader will appear, remove three nations, replace them, and rule as the Antichrist until the King of Kings returns to earth and destroys the evil empire. Thus the common market will grow to thirteen nations, and these thirteen could eventually control all nations, and finally be reduced to ten at the end when this ten-toed, ten-horned confederacy is destroyed. This is the event described by Daniel 
as a stone cut out without hands, breaking in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Of course, today we also have to look at bricks and the rise of um, their, the nations in bricks. Um, but then Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and 45 occurs. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Um, yes, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream has come to pass throughout hundreds of years of history, and the present alignment of Western nations in the form of the European Union may well be the final piece in the puzzle. Prepare to meet thy God. Amos 4.12. Um, but verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Now we've already discovered that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome constitute the last four empires of world history. We also have learned that the revived Roman Empire originated in 1948 in the form of a final ten-nation confederation, um, becomes the end-time power block. Daniel 7 pictures these four empires as a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast, who is a combination of the previous world powers he has conquered. The beast's empire contains a portion of each preceding empire. Actually, the only difference between the description of John and Daniel is that the order is reversed in the book of Revelation. The reason for this is simple. John is looking back to the beginning, while Daniel is looking forward to the conclusion. Putting it all together, the message of the ten horns, the ten toes, and the four beasts is one and the same from different vantage points, and all picture a world dictator govern, um, governing ten nations at the time of the end. This ten-nation confederacy constitutes the revival of the fourth power, the old Roman Empire, as um, typified by the fourth monstrous animal or beast. So verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The wounding of the beast is mentioned three times in this chapter, verse 3, 12, and 14. The wound produces death, but restoration to life follows. Some commentators think that this statement represents the fall of the old Roman Empire and its restoration through the ten-nation confederacy. Um, others believe that it speaks of the resurrection of Judas Iscariot, for he and the Antichrist are the only ones ever called the son of perdition. Um, John 17, 12, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, um, God alone knows. A third possibility would be that the Antichrist is assassinated or killed midway through the tribulation hour. See Daniel eleven forty five. That's um, the view I see. Such an event would give the great counterfeiter Satan the opportunity to perform a resurrection. This would prove invaluable to the prestige of the Antichrist since the deity of the Lord Jesus was affirmed by his resurrection 2,000 years before. See Matthew 12, 39 and 40. Remember that the Antichrist proclaims himself God and even sits in the temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation. See 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 and Matthew 24, 15. Thus, a counterfeit resurrection would assure the world that he is all he claims to be. I personally believe that this is the correct solution, because when it happens, all the world will wonder after him. Mankind is literally overwhelmed by the Antichrist's power and authority. Um, verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Another reason that verse 3 may speak of an actual resurrection is that millions who previously would not believe in the Antichrist now begin to worship him and Satan. In the second half of this chapter, uh, we will see that the false prophet or religious um, leader of the tribulation period actually enforces the worship of the Antichrist. 
since the people think of him as God, they cry, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Yes, who can combat this self-proclaimed God and be victorious? Verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Um, the Antichrist's blasphemy during the final three and one half years of the tribulation hour most likely has to do with his mockery of the Almighty. One of the reasons God hates idolatry, the use of images in worship, is that he wants no rivals. Here Jehovah in Exodus 24 and 5, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below, beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow, down, bow thyself to them nor serve them, for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. Um, think of the insult to the Eternal One when the Antichrist says, I am God, and teeming millions bow to him, um, to Satan, to the false prophet, and to the image, the abomination of desolation erected in his honor. And this blasphemy continues in verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Jesus, the true God, was accused of blasphemy in his day because he claimed to be God. See Matthew 9, 3. Ironically, the world accepts the Antichrist's claim to deity, and this per perpetrated lie is blasphemy to God. The blasphemy is undoubtedly intensified because Satan himself is speaking. Now here is a thought-provoking theory. During the first 42 months of the tribulation, the Antichrist acts under the influence of Satan, However, after, after Satan is cast out of heaven in chapter 12 and comes to earth, he may actually incarnate himself in the dead body of the Antichrist who had the wound by the sword and did live. Chapter 14. Thus the beast is raised from the dead by the counterfeit Satan who dwells in that body for the final 42 months claiming deity. As a result, he is able to experience that which he sought when he was cast out of heaven crying, I will be like the Most High. See Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Um, Satan's ultimate desire is now realized. He is worshipped as God. The blasphemy is unspeakable. He desecrates everything his filthy hands touched, including the tabernacle and its worshippers. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The fight is on for the saints of the tribulation hour. Remember, this is not the church. Satan battles the church as they return with Christ, chapter 19, verse 14. Um, in the scene before us, he is attempting to destroy the millions who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, chapter 7, verse 14, and who also refused the mark of the beast, chapter 20, verse 4. Instead of experiencing defeat, they overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, chapter 12, verse 11. During this time, the Antichrist controls the entire world. He is an international um, despot, exercising power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Such a one-world government is almost upon us. Um, consider for a moment the global organizations which have become ex existent in our day, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the International Labor Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or World Bank, the International Development Association, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, commonly called UNESCO, the World Health Organization, the International Finance Corporation, the International Monetary Fund, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Universal Postal Union, the International Telecommunications Union, the World Meteorological Association, the Intergovernment Maritime Consultative Organization, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade Organization. Um, the formation of such international um, alliances has led outstanding thinkers to state that a new world order is on the horizon. Um, presently, we may be witnessing mankind's final approach to the much publicized new world order or one world government of the Antichrist. At this point in history, all the world will be amazed 
at this self-styled deity takes control, um, and the majority will submit to his authority. However, God always has a remnant who will not bow to Baal or other de deities. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. The true believers of the tribulation hour will have nothing to do with this satanic monster, even though they will not be able to buy or sell without approval. Chapter 13, verse 17. Their love for Christ will mean more than life, shelter, and food. They will love Christ to the end. For John declares, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Chapter 20, verse 4. Um, the tribulation hour is approaching. Um, will a demon-possessed or devil incarnate human claim deity and be accepted as a world leader and be worshipped as God? Um, yeah. <sighs> Henry Spayek, a spokesman for the Society of Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications in Brussels, Belgium, headquarters for the common market, made a profound statement Relevate, um, relevant to that organization's goals and operations a few years ago. He said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the, the allegiance of the people and lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Such, um, send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will accept him. Um, the life and death matter of verses 1 through 8 is so important that God repeats the warning he so often presented to the seven churches. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Beware, take heed. Think seriously. Well, why? Um, well, verse 10 says that he leadeth into captivity. Um, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. This is the exact caution that Paul stressed in Galatians 6, 7, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, identifying himself with Christianity. And so he spake as a dragon, identifying him, um, him with Satan. Verse 11 through 18 introduces us to the second beast, the religious fake or false prophet who is the third member of the satanic trinity. The devil imitates the father and the antichrist imitates the son and the false prophet imitates the Holy Spirit. This religious hypocrite fulfills the prediction of the savior who said in Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Clearly the power of the false prophet is in the realm of religion. He is co-equal in power with the Antichrist. Um, one heads up the secular world, while the other controls the religious scene. These two work closely together. The Antichrist shares his authority with the with the false prophet protecting him and his religious um, colossus in return for a promise of royalty, of loyalty and devotion. Thus, as head of the world church, the false prophet sees to it that the Antichrist, who is wounded and resurrected, is worshipped. They're going to be quite the team. Um, the second beast is also one of the greatest miracle workers in history. Verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of the men. These great wonders are called lying wonders in Second Thessalonians 2 verse 9. They are not magical um, sleight of hand manipulations, but the result of supernatural power from the dragon that enables these men to even produce fire. Since God often revealed himself by fire, um, see Genesis 19, 24 and Leviticus 10, 1 and 2 and 1 Kings 13, I mean, 1838, the false prophet also uses fire. 
Satan shares his supernatural power for one reason. Verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. The sole purpose of all these miracles is to prepare the people for idolatry. The false prophet actually entices mankind to build the greatest statue in history in the very image of the Antichrist. This monstrosity will be erected in Jerusalem and will be placed in the Jewish temple. Uh, such a blasphemous act is against the Jewish conscience and is forbidden by the second commandment. See Exodus 24. And this is why the image is such an obnoxious, hateful, and abominable thing and is labeled the abomination of desolation by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, 15. Verse 15. Um, now this makes me think that it's probably going to be an AI um, of some sort. But And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Since the image is able to speak, it might as well be the ultimate achievement of our present-day computer systems already capable of conducting intelligent conversations. Um, yeah, AI. Um, the processing power and speed of computers is growing each and every year. Um, IBM's Roadrunner computer has just shattered the previous record. It is capable of processing 1.026 quadrillion calculations per second. That's over a thousand trillion calculations per second. The previous record was held by another IBM computer. Um, but I believe that the Antichrist will enslave and control Earth's billions of inhabitants through such an all-knowing monstrous computer. I think it's going to be AI. Um, already we have new technology since this commentary was written. Such a system is absolutely essential to his having all the facts on every member of the human race at his fingertips. Um, as a result, he will, with the unerring precision, be able to know who receives his orders, obeys his commands, and honors his laws. His computer um, will also tell him who Earth's rebels are. The new technology is crazy. crazy. We've got a new um, like brain that they've made. Um, the Antichrist will most certainly use such a computer, and it will be fashioned in his own image. AI. And that technology is here, and it's surpassed even a few years ago. Um, but verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. And cashless society, which is exactly where we're headed. Digital currency. Um, but as we've seen, the Antichrist will undoubtedly use a computer to enslave Earth's population during the tribulation hour. Um, also, we discover that he will affect and maintain his control through commerce, the buying and selling of products. In order to make his plan operable, the Antichrist will also introduce an international identification system in the form of a mark, um, possibly a laser tattoo or the R RDIF chip. Um, there's many contestants for this mark right now. Um, placed in the right hand or forehead of every individual participant. Without this mark, no man... Uh, no man will be permitted to purchase or sell even the smallest items of merchandise. You won't be able to work because you can't get paid. Um, you won't be able to sell anything. You'll lose everything you own because you won't be able to pay taxes. Or, um, But according to verses 17 and 18, this identification mark will be or will include as a prefix the digit 666. Um, the use of 666 as a prefix appears most plausible as this is the only way one person could be differentiated from another. If all numbers were identical, mass confusion would ensue. Therefore, prefixes preceding the 666 or using the 666 as the prefix code are essential for marketing purposes. There's a lot of um, opinions on the number 666, that it's the number of a man um, in the Hebrew um, alphabet. But... Um, with specific references to verse 18, 
one should be aware of the fact that there have always been and always will be individuals who claim to know the identity of the Antichrist. They take the number 666 and through all kinds of mathematical form formulations attempt to come to a conclusion. Their efforts, however, can amount to no more than mere speculation because we cannot know who the Antichrist is until he arrives on the scene, and he cannot arrive until the church is raptured. Still, God's um, word admonishes the Christian to be wise. See Matthew 10, 16. And watchful. See Matthew 24, 42. Especially as the day of Christ's return approaches. <clears throat> See Hebrews 10, 25. As shocking as the information presented in this chapter may seem, such a day is at hand. Um, a cashless, checklist society is not just in the planning stages anymore. It's being implemented in many countries today. Um, they're not just experimenting. It's actually being used already. Um, and, oh my goodness, we didn't even mention Neuralink when we were talking about technology, but it's later than you think. Um, the reign of the Antichrist is upon the horizon. Uh, this new Hitler with a, monstru with a monstrous computer which will enslave millions, may soon control the earth. Um, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah 55, verse 6. And we're going to stop. Um, that is the end of chapter 13. And um, we'll look into 15 through probably not 18 or 19 next. Um We are very close, and the signs are all ramping up, and we're not looking for signs of the rapture, because there are no signs to precede the rapture. We're looking for, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing all of the events of the tribulation form, and um, right before our eyes. Those are the signs that we're looking at, and we're seeing the signs of the last days, and there are many, um, many let me see here. So some of the biggest signs would have been 1948 when Israel became a nation. Uh, the Revelation 12 sign as a warning that we just saw. And the child is right now headed into the scales of judgment, which is Libra, which used to be called the altar. Um, we've got the beast technology. And don't forget the days of Lot. Um, pride. That hasn't gone away. That was big and still is. Um, they're coming after the children. Um, we've got the war in Israel. We've got earthquakes in diverse places. We've got floods, unprecedented floods, as is the days of Noah um, happening all over. Um, famine, inflation, anti-Semitism, fires, volcano, deception, um, UFOs, aliens, um, declassified. This is a great cover-up for the, that, the missing Christians um, at the rapture, um, Satanism, idols, those, that's on the rise. If, you, if you're not worshiping Jesus, you're worshiping something else. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping Satan, um, self-worship. Even atheists worship something. Um, hatred, anger, and selfishness is on the rise. We've got AI, blasphemy. I mean, there's so much that we're seeing today, the signs in the heavens, so we're looking up because Jesus said that when you see these things begin to happen, look up because your redemption draws near. I want to see you in heaven. 